When we think of China today, high-speed railways, record-breaking bridges, and futuristic cities instantly come to mind. It's a country that's no stranger to building massive infrastructure projects at jaw-dropping scales. So when news breaks of another ambitious Chinese megaproject, it barely raises eyebrows anymore. But this time, it's not a towering skyscraper or a new bullet train. It's something much more fundamental, water. At first, it doesn't sound like a big deal. Water, pipes, pumps, we've had those for centuries. But once again, China is thinking bigger, much bigger. Imagine building a man-made river system that carries water across hundreds of miles, flowing over mountains and through deserts, all to balance nature's uneven distribution. That's exactly what China is doing. To understand why this is necessary, let's look at a basic but critical truth. China is split in two, not by politics or geography, but by water. In the south, nature has been generous. The climate is warm and subtropical, with short winters and abundant rainfall. This lush environment is home to China's most famous rivers, the Yellow River and the mighty Yangtze. These rivers have sustained civilizations for thousands of years and continue to do so today. Take the Yellow River, or Huanghe, stretching nearly 3,400 miles. It supplies water to over 50 cities irrigates nearly one-fifth of China's farmland, and supports millions of people. It's no wonder it's often called the cradle of Chinese civilization. But even this iconic river pales in comparison to the Yangtze, which flows for nearly 3,915 miles. It's not only China's longest river, but the longest in all of Eurasia, ranking third in the world by water volume. Rich in biodiversity and essential for agriculture, the Yangtze made the southern regions of China a true paradise for rice farming. Here, Floods are often a bigger problem than drought. In fact, there's so much water in the south that it occasionally turns deadly. Typhoons and monsoons frequently batter the region, causing devastating floods. Rivers like the Yangtze and Yellow often overflow, releasing torrents of muddy, debris-filled water that can destroy homes and farmland in minutes. The Yellow River is notorious for this, as its riverbed rises higher than the surrounding land due to years of sediment buildup. Despite the dangers, the South is undeniably rich in water resources. The same can't be said for the North. Northern China is a different story altogether. Winters are long, cold, and dry. Summer swing to the opposite extreme. Hot, humid, and suffocating. Comfortable seasons like spring and autumn are short-lived. And if that weren't enough, rainfall here is scarce. The land is dry, dusty, and heavily affected by desertification. This is where you'll find the vast Gobi Desert, and the even more formidable Taklamakan, China's largest desert. Sandstorms and droughts are common, agriculture is difficult, and worst of all, water is desperately scarce. Nowhere is this more apparent than in Beijing. As China's capital, Beijing is home to over 21 million people, but its water resources are shockingly low. For years, the city depended on underground aquifers, but repeated droughts and rampant industrial pollution have left them depleted and contaminated. At one point, Water availability per person in Beijing dropped to just 26,400 gallons per year. That's not a typo. It's only one twelfth of China's national average, one one hundred and eightieth of the global average, and far below the international threshold for severe water scarcity. For comparison, the United Nations defines water stress at anything below 449,000 gallons per person annually. This water shortage isn't just an environmental issue, it's an economic one. China loses an estimated $35 billion every year due to water scarcity in the north, a figure more than double the economic losses caused by flooding in the south. So, how do you solve a problem like this? You could try conservation or desalination, but China had another idea, something bold and enormous, move the water. The concept isn't new. In fact, it dates back to 1952, when Mao Zedong famously said, the south has plenty of water, the north very little. If possible, water could be borrowed. That simple statement sparked the idea for what would eventually become one of the largest water transfer projects in human history. But ideas are one thing, implementation is another. For decades, the South North Water Transfer Project remained on paper. It wasn't until the 1990s that it gained serious political and financial backing. In 2002, after 50 years of discussion, China finally broke ground. The project's goal to move an astonishing 11.7 trillion gallons of water every year to the parched north using three colossal canal systems, the eastern, central, and western routes. Construction of the eastern route began in December 2002. This system redirects part of the Yangtze River's massive flow northward, 
Even in the driest years, the Yangtze pushes more than 158 trillion gallons annually. So siphoning off 4 trillion gallons isn't a significant loss for the South. The main pumping station was placed near Jiangdu and was capable of moving 14,000 cubic feet of water per second. From there, water flowed along the Grand Canal, eventually reaching Shandong province and then flowing into reservoirs near Tianjin. The entire system spanned 767 miles and required major engineering feats, including a 230-foot deep tunnel under the Yellow River in Shandong province. 23 pumping stations, producing a combined 454 megawatts of power, helped lift the water across varied terrain. By 2017, this route was fully operational and delivering 264 billion gallons of water per year to the north. Next came the central route, perhaps the most iconic of the three. Often referred to as the Grand Aqueduct, this system runs from the Han River, a Yangtze tributary, straight to Beijing. A major part of the project was raising the height of the Danjianka Dam, boosting its elevation from 531 to 581 feet. This allowed gravity to do the work. No pumping required. Water now flows downhill for 785 miles straight into the capital. The project was completed in phases between 2004 and 2014. Today, the central route delivers about 3.4 trillion gallons of water each year. However, diverting so much water from the Han River did cause problems downstream, reducing its flow and impacting local ecosystems. To address this, China launched the Yinjiang Buhan Tunnel Project in 2022. This massive underground waterway will connect the Three Gorges Reservoir to the Han River, effectively refilling it, spanning 870 miles, including six miles deep underground. The project is expected to cost $8.9 billion and be completed by 2032. Lastly, there's the Western Route, by far the most challenging. This route aims to connect the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers by cutting through the Qing Haidabet Plateau, also known as the Roof of the World. At nearly three miles above sea level, this region is remote, unstable, and environmentally fragile. Unlike the other two routes, construction on the Western Route hasn't fully begun. It presents enormous geological and political challenges, not to mention the risk of disturbing a region rich in biodiversity and cultural heritage. For now, the Western Route remains largely in the planning phase, though feasibility studies and design work are ongoing. China's South North Water Transfer Project is nothing short of historic. It took over half a century of planning, faced monumental technical challenges, and sparked environmental debates. But it's already reshaping the country. The Eastern and Central routes alone now supply water to over 120 million people. Cities like Beijing and Tianjin, once on the brink of crisis, have found a lifeline. Of course, the project isn't without criticism. Environmentalists warn about the long-term consequences of draining southern rivers and disrupting ecosystems. Engineers continue to wrestle with maintenance and logistics. And with climate change altering rainfall patterns, future adjustments may be necessary. Still, one thing is clear. In a country where uneven water distribution could have divided its people, China instead chose to build connections, literal ones, on a scale the world has never seen before.